curious. I am curious. Curious by nature. When most people hear about youth, suicide, and depression, they have an immediate and normal negative response. However, today I ask you to listen to this so you can hear some of the ways you can catch the first signs of depression or other mental health issues in young people around you. The signs can be visible 10 to 12 years before a problem becomes apparent. And noticing and acting early can be so helpful and crucial. My guest today has dedicated his career to finding solutions to serious mental health problems. Welcome, Dr. Trivedi. Please introduce yourself and explain what you do. I'm Madhuka Trivedi. I'm a professor of psychiatry and founding director of the Center for Depression Research and Clinical Care here at the O'Donnell Brain Institute at UT Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. Can you tell me more about your work and what you focus on? So I focus on uh, depression both for treatment as well as looking at biomarkers in order to as develop precision approaches to treatment so that we are able to then begin to stop the trial and error process but start really matching the right patient with the right treatment at the right time. Can you tell me more about your recent research study? One of the things that is beginning to be very clear is that depression, bipolar disorder, often, most often actually, begin early in life. And so this transition period after puberty is the first peak and the second peak is when kids go back off to college. And so recently our work has really focused on this younger youth population in order to understand the onset of depression and then identify biomarkers associated with depression and suicide. And so the recent work on suicide with youth is really beginning to look at the number of kids we have been recruiting through a longitudinal study to identify what are the characteristics of kids, the young people who have attempted or have had serious suicidal ideation and thoughts. And so that is really the work we are doing currently because one of the challenges for us in, in depression bipolar disorder is often we treat people only when there is a crisis and not early. And as a result, there is often a delay of 10 to 12 years between the onset of symptoms and the first time they get treated. And unfortunately, because this is a brain disease, that 10, 12 year period really leads to a significant amount of, uh, of challenges and toxicity to the brain. So we need to be doing this very early, and that has really been the focus of my work. You can tell us some things that people can look to or notice in those initial years before they can, um, I guess, start getting help and in the beginning. But first, I wanted to talk more about your research study and ask you more about your findings show that a high percentage of youth suicides had sexual trauma involved in them. Can you say more about that? So early life trauma is really being seen as a predictor or a predisposing factor for depression, and that's been well known. But what we are now finding out is that if you look at the population of teenagers who are going to see a psychiatrist and evaluate how many of them have had history of early life trauma, that really is very high rates. And the early life trauma is generally in three types of trauma. There is either physical abuse, there is sexual abuse, and then there is neglect. But the sexual abuse part is really the one that really drives a lot of early life trauma and onset of depression. If someone has had early life sexual trauma, is there something else in addition to that that makes them extremely likely to have suicidal thoughts? So I think the, the there are three four things that happen. One is there is a little bit of genetic predisposition. There's high rates of family history of depression in people who are uh, have an early onset. The second is early life trauma. And the third is, I think, lack of support during this period so that they, just because somebody has early life trauma doesn't automatically mean they'll develop depression. But then they don't have support and they don't have the kind of help needed early on to overcome the result of these trauma. 
And then that is what really associated with depression, suicidal ideation. So I saw your TED talk and I really liked it. And I'd like to share it here so that more people can see it and listen to it. But also you said that a lot of people try to, they push away. They don't want to hear about youth suicides. But you mentioned in that talk that there is a way to change. It can be better and there's hope. So from your research, I guess, related to youth suicides and the sexual trauma, can you talk a little bit about where that hope lies and how things can get better? Absolutely. I think one of the things is we as a society have to change the way we are tra- dealing with this. Time for us to not wait for there to be a crisis before we intervene. So high schoolers and uh, and undergraduate students should be routinely screened for depression, suicidal ideation, etc. So that's the first thing we have to do. Second thing we have to do is make it really as part of a general medical condition so that primary care physicians, family physicians, and pediatricians start including the assessment of depression, suicidal ideation in their routine care. They measure blood pressure for every teenager that comes in, but they don't really evaluate for depression, suicide, anxiety. And that needs to be part of that. So those two things will go a long way. And the third thing we have to remember is both there is a role for parents and adults in these young people's lives. If, for example, somebody is has two thoughts of suicide or, or, or dejection, if a loving adult in their lives asks them about it, they experience significant amount of relief, and then they will be ready to seek help. So we have to stop ignoring this. One of the things, we, we hear this in our society all the time, teenagers being teenagers. I think if there is a change in the teenager's behavior. Either they were very friendly and now they're isolated, or they were, uh, or they are closing their door and not communicating, they're becoming irritable, we should pay attention and take them to a pediatrician so to be evaluated. Ignoring this until there is a crisis really is dangerous, and that's really what our message is. Do you see that these things, these changes and these ways that things can change are being implemented in certain places, like in schools? Are you seeing that there is that change, or if not, what would be needed? to do that from your perspective? I think there is a slow change. I would like, I am impatient. We need to have faster change. I mean, I think this is a, this is a real devastating illness. We, you know, in the U.S., depression and suicide in teenagers has been going up while the rest of the Western world, it's leveled off. So we really have a public health crisis and we need to do more, but things are changing. Uh, we are working with young people. We are working in schools, high schools, etc. We are doing a five-session prevention resilience building program, and schools are welcoming us. So there is a change happening. I wish it happens faster. Mm-hmm. Is there something you would like the media to be aware of about your work or this topic other than what we've mentioned now? I think the media needs to start treating depression, suicide, and mental illness as part of any other medical condition and not leave it as a separate thing. It is really, this. it is now very clear that depression, suicidal ideation behavior is a brain disease. And so we have to start thinking, media has to start talking about it as if it is a real medical illness. How did you decide to go into this field? I think the the way the brain functions is just fascinating. <laughs> How it fails to function in certain places is a fascinating thing. And my interest is really to try to find the best ways to diagnose and treat. Secondly, I think one of the things that people forget is if for mental illness you identify early and find the right treatment, the outcomes are fantastic. People can have, lead a normal life. And so that is really why I do this work. Mm-hmm. And you see that happening constantly. So it gives you absolutely hope. That's great. Uh, what questions would you like to answer that I haven't asked? I think the one thing that we need as a society, parents and adults and community has to get engaged. This is something we should demand better outcomes for 
This is not where we should be shy. Uh, communities and population should demand more of the health medical system, more of educational systems, and not let this be ignored. 20 years, 30 years back, remember in schools, people were not getting tested for their vision and their hearing. Kids were not. Now, nobody questions it. Everybody gets done. that, And so that anybody who has a problem with hearing or vision then gets the right treatment. I think we need to create a structure where we do the same for mental health. What would you say are three things parents should keep in mind or, or do today if they could do it with their children? Be aware and be communicative. You should always be able to, they should be able to communicate and tell you where their problems are. Secondly, if you see any change in their behavior or their, their, uh, their way of dealing with the rest of the world, do not ignore it and call it teens being teens. And the third is, I think, getting their uh, pediatricians really involved if there is any change. And how do you see drug use involved in this? Not illicit drug use, not um, medications. Is there, do you see something that is affecting mental health for you? Absolutely. I think illicit drug use and alcohol use are big challenges and big risk factors for mental health. Uh, and in fact, one of the things that has been happening in the country over the last 10 years is this over dependence on thinking that cannabis is okay. Cannabis for the young population, especially in the growing brain, is very toxic, and I think that is really a big risk. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Trivedi. I appreciate it. Curious by Nature is a production of Newswise. More than 7,000 journalists get the Newswise wires. Visit newswise.com and find out how to spread your news today.